First, giving honor to God, who is the source of all my strength, the source of all I am, all I ever was, and all that I could ever hope to be. Giving honor to Reverend Beverly and the spiritual staff here at the La Crescenta Center for Spiritual Living. I just want to say good morning to all of you and to let you know what indeed a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege it is for me to have the opportunity to stand before you. My name is Gerald C. Rivers. And uh, in some circles, I'm more known than in others, but um, I work as an actor and as a drummer and as a teacher and as an inspirational speaker and a voiceover artist. But I tell people all the time, all of those things are what I do for a living. And what I do for a life is to remind people about the words and works of the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a message that is timeless and essential and probably more important right now than ever before. So I'm so grateful and honored that Reverend Beverly will have me here every year on the first Sunday of Black History Month to remember to remind, to come into a new mind about the teachings of Dr. King, which are the teachings of this philosophy. I think about the fact that I go to church at Agape with Reverend Michael, and uh, Reverend Michael literally named the church Agape after a speech that Dr. King gave when he explored the meanings of love and described Agape as the love of God operating in the human heart. And so it's ironic and beautiful that not only is it Black History Month, but it is also the season for nonviolence. And what that means, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but for those who may or may not be, at the end of January, when Gandhi died, we begin the season of nonviolence and go for 64 days until April 4, when Martin Luther King died. And every day we celebrate a principle or a way of peace. So it's 64 days and 64 ways of peace established by Arush Gandhi, who is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, and Reverend Michael and the Association for Global New Thought. So each day we get to commemorate, celebrate, activate one of these principles in our lives. And the principle, the very first one was courage, and then there was smiling. And uh, for the third day, it's gratitude. And so I just encourage you to embrace these ideas. You can look it up for yourself and figure out what day it is for you. But um, I, I, I stand in courage because the work that we have to do is important. I just want to define courage for you. So many people think they have to be brave in order to be, courage, to be courageous. And the truth is you don't have to be brave. You just have to be willing. You have to be willing to trust that a power greater than yourself will operate through you and bring you everything that you need to make a creative contribution in the life of our nation and of our society. You don't have to be brave. You just have to be willing. You don't have to be charismatic. You just have to care. And you don't You don't have to be more than you are. The truth is you are enough just as you are and where you are right now. You don't have to do everything, but you can do something. And so you can begin right where you are, making a change for the better, helping to bring about what Dr. King described as the beloved community where every man would respect the dignity and the worth of human personality. And I think that in, it, in and of itself is profound in that we are each unique 
individualized expressions of the one mind consciousness. But in that, we all have a unique role to play and we all have a wonderful opportunity to make a difference. King would say that I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the way the world is made. It's called the interrelated structure of reality. And so as long as there is extreme poverty in this world, no man can be totally rich even if he has a billion dollars. As long as diseases are rampant, and we know something about that right now, no man can be totally healthy even if he just got a checkup and a vaccination in the finest clinics of the nation. We are all interconnected. And the sooner we realize that as a nation, as a world, as a people, as a species, we will all be better off. So this season for nonviolence, I need to just explore this idea of nonviolence briefly. Nonviolence is not merely the absence of violence. It is the presence of peace and justice and truth. Nonviolence is not merely, I'm not having conflict, I'm not fighting with somebody right now, so therefore I am not being nonviolent. The truth is, the true definition of nonviolence is not merely the absence of violence, but the presence of peace, the presence of justice, the presence of joy and love and gratitude. So it's not, if I'm not in conflict with somebody today, that must mean I'm nonviolent. Really, am I engaging? Am I incorporating? Am I involving all of the other things that make me a peaceful, nonviolent person? That's the truth of what this is. And King teaches me that nonviolence not only calls upon its adherence to avoid external physical violence, but to avoid internal violence of spirit as well. And what does that really mean? That really means that if you have a calling, a yearning, a soul's ache that is encouraging you to do something or to be something or to participate or to say something and you don't do it, you are violating your own spirit. We are all called to our own unique purposes with our own unique abilities and talents and capacities that nobody else on the planet has. And when you don't listen to that calling, when you miss the mark, so to speak, it's no wonder you are in dis-ease. There is discomfort because the truth of who you really are is crying out saying, be present be available, make a difference, help someone, smile, be encouraging, contribute, be creative, be who you were meant to be. And when you don't do it, you're creating an internal conflict for yourself that for some can be unbearable. And what I tell people all the time is don't wait for the universe to take everything away before you step up and do what you know you are meant to do. And with some of us, you know, they say that God will chase and chasten those that he loves. We will run from our calling and our purpose for decades. And then all of a sudden when we've lost our loved ones and we've lost our home and we've lost our health and we've lost our job, then we decide maybe now I can go and do that thing I always wanted to do. I was always meant to do. And so I'm encouraging you today to show up for yourself and to be who you were meant to be and create more peace, more love, more joy, more gratitude, not only within the world, but within yourself. This idea of nonviolence is not foreign to me, having grown up in Compton, California, in the late 70s, early 80s, with the rise of gangs and crips and bloods and crack cocaine and drive-by shootings. And what I'm here to say to you is that if I can come from an environment like that and be a proponent worldwide for peace, then you can do something. 
I watched my best friend murdered in his front yard when I was 16 years old. Haven't had a best friend since then. I think it atrophied something in me that said, I don't know if I really want to get close to people because then they're going to leave. And the pain of them being gone is so deep and so real that I'm not sure I want to do that. So I'm going to hitch my wagon to purpose. And I'm going to meet people, incredible people along the way, but I'm going to keep returning to the work. Keep returning to the job of making my little corner of the globe a little better, a little more peaceful, a little more loving. And it's interesting because I've been giving these talks now for years, and I tell people all the time, I will do it for more years and more decades to come. I will keep doing it for millions and millions of people until one person gets it. And I know that King was tired. I know he was saying the same thing over and over to so many people. He had to have been exhausted. And he said in his own words, I'm tired sometimes. It's hard being criticized by people all the time, even people who are like me, who are suggesting that maybe what I'm doing is not right. But I know that I have a greater calling and that it involves this way of peace this way of nonviolence, this way of justice. He said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And the kids, when they're marching in the streets, are sometimes screaming, no justice, no peace. But I want those kids, and if any of them are watching today, to first deal with your own stuff. It was so easy for young people of all colors and creeds to get out into the streets and march and protest and say black lives matter. But some of them were angry about other things. And they just found a vehicle or an outlet for that anger and that rage. What I'm saying is if you do the work on you, then you have what we call discernment. And you know, that's their issue. That's their problem. That's not mine. Mine is to show up and be who I am and, is to, and to participate in my own healing in as peaceful and loving a way as I possibly can. King would say, they would say, suggest that this way of nonviolence, that this way of universal peace and universal love is ineffective. And he would argue that you're wrong. That this idea not only allows us to achieve moral ends through moral means, but it has certain practical consequences as well. It exposes the moral defenses of the opponent. It weakens his morale, and at the same time, it's working on his conscience, and he doesn't know what to do. They know what to do with violence. They've had a lot of practice. They have developed armies worldwide. And King would say, perhaps we spent far too much of our money establishing military bases rather than bases of genuine concern and understanding. But it's true that people don't know how to handle nonviolence, not when you can really practice it and apply it. And they taught it not far from here in Pasadena because people needed to understand what it really meant. And, and I, to give you an example, uh, Mike Tyson was this great boxer, and people would say, I've got a plan. And Mike Tyson would say, yeah, everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And then all of a sudden, they get angry and flustered. And so when you practice this way of peace and nonviolence, your initial interaction with someone is not the most important one. Because anybody can show up with a smile on their face and say, hi, I'm sorry, I love you. But what happens when that person says, get out of my face, I don't like you, don't come over here with that. That's when we get a chance to go deeper into our practice. That's when we get a chance to be more peaceful, more loving, more kind, and not agree with them that that way of being is the right way. Because the moment we meet them where they are, we're agreeing that this way of political rhetoric and anger and animosity and, and crap is our true nature, and it's not. 
Our true nature is to be kind and loving and helpful to one another. That's our true nature. That's who we really are. Most of us have all these layers of hurt and pain and guilt and scars and unresolved issues from our childhood that come up every time we have an interaction with somebody that we don't like. So we get a chance to go deep within and heal ourselves first and forgive ourselves first for all the things we wish we had done or wanted to do and never got a chance to do. You still got a chance to do it. And then I say this all the time. I'm going to say it again. Forgive everyone. We are so busy withholding love from other people because we think they have wronged us that we're creating toxic chemicals in our own physical body. Not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. The forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. It's for you to release this toxic animosity that is preventing you from being the loving person that you truly are. I don't care what they did. We are no better than Jesus the Christ when he sat on the cross and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. If people really knew that what they did not only harmed them, but harmed not only harmed you, but harmed them, they wouldn't have done it. So they don't know. And they need us to stand in the gap for them until they're ready to stand in that gap for themselves and hold a piece of place of love and compassion and forgiveness. By forgiving, I mean give it forward. Give them something you don't think or believe they have earned or deserved. If you're waiting on them to apologize and to make amends and make it right, that's not forgiveness. That's a negotiation. That's a business transaction. And I know our country right now is filled with tension and animosity and rhetoric. But if we can begin where we are, being peaceful and loving, there is a radiant echo that happens from the center of our being that goes out to the corner, every corner of the earth. So I'm just asking one person today to join me in finding that center core of peace within you and radiate that. Focus on that. And then it becomes clear, this discernment, what you are to do next. A way is made, as King would say, out of no way. Out of no thing, everything will appear when you first settle down and remember who and what you really are. You are a spiritual being having a human incarnation, and you chose to be here. So don't get mad at the people who are participating in your movie right now because you made the choice to be here, and you put those people around you because every opportunity, every situation is the potential for you to have the greatest opportunity for growth, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Every situation you place yourself in is giving you the greatest potential and opportunity for your own growth. Take it, the good and the so-called bad, and be loving while you do it. Be loving to yourself. Lord, have mercy. You're concerned that somebody else doesn't love you. I, a, a friend of mine wrote a song that said, I love myself so much that I can love you so much, that you can love you so much, that you can start loving me. So love yourself, forgive yourself. It doesn't mean you didn't do anything wrong, because you did, but you can forgive yourself and move forward today. So uh, I'm just gonna explore some of this philosophy of nonviolence by the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I just ask you to, Open your hearts and your minds to the eternal truth of these words as we celebrate both Black History Month and the season for nonviolence. We must work through the courts. 
through legislation, through the ballot boxes. This is one of the most significant steps that we can take at this hour, going to the ballot box. Now, I've tried to talk in militant terms for the last few minutes. But in the midst of this militancy, let us always realize that we don't have to hate as we try to straighten this situation out. Let us always realize that we don't have to become bitter as we try to straighten this situation out. Oh, if there's any one thing I would like for you to remember this morning, it is the fact that somebody must have some sense in this world. Somebody must have sense enough to meet hate with love. Somebody must have sense enough to meet physical force with soul force. We will but try this way. We will be able to change these conditions and yet at the same time win the hearts and souls of those who have kept these conditions alive. And I know how frustrated we get. And we have a right to get frustrated. And I know that there are those who end up feeling that the problem can't be solved within, so they talk about some kind of separation rather than the truth of integration. I understand their response. I have analyzed it psychologically and I understand it. But in spite of the fact that I understand it, I must say to them in patient terms that that isn't the way. I must say to them in patient terms that black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. And God is not interested. God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. But God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race. The creation of a society where all men will live together as brothers. No, we need not hate. We need not use violence. There is another way. We're as old as the insights of Jesus of Nazareth and as modern as the techniques of Mohandas K. Gandhi. There is another way. We're as old as Jesus saying, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. And to every potential Peter, put up your sword. History is replete with the bleached bones of nations. History is cluttered with the wreckage of communities that failed to follow this command. And isn't it marvelous to have a method of struggle where it is possible to stand up against an unjust system, fight it with all of your might, never accept it, and yet not stoop to violence and hatred in the process? There is another way. Where's old as Gandhi saying through Thoreau that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. There is another way. Where's old as Jesus saying, turn the other cheek. And when he said that, he realized that turning the other cheek might bring suffering sometimes. He realized that it might get your home bombed sometimes. He realized that it might get you stabbed sometimes. He realized that it might get you scarred up sometimes. But he was saying in substance that it is better to go through life with a scarred up body than a scarred up soul. There is another way. If we will but try this way, we will be the participants in a great building process to make America a new nation. And I know that there are those who are asking, how long will we have to live with this system? How long will prejudice blind the visions of men, darken their understanding and drive bright-eyed wisdom from her sacred throne? When will wounded justice, lying prostrate on the streets of our cities, be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men? Yes, when will the radiant star of hope be plunged against the nocturnal bosom of this lonely night and pluck from weary souls the manacles of death and the chains of fear. How long will justice be crucified and truth buried? How long? I can only answer this morning, not long. 
How long? Not long. Because truth crushed earth will rise again. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. How long? Not long. Because truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways our future. Behind the dim unknown standard, God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because you still reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory and the coming of our Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet which shall never call retreat. He has lifted up the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Thank you.